This is a production of Cornell University. Oh, hello, everybody. I am delighted to be here virtually, if not in person. And thank you very much for Northeast ISA for my invitation to present some information I think will be interesting for you. Uh, this is uh, work that uh, myself and Peter Trowbridge have done, and Peter's not going to be uh, presenting today with me, uh, but it's both of our work uh, that we did at Cornell University for, for many, many years. So let's get into the creating the sustainable urban landscape talk, and uh, we can take questions after. So uh, when we're talking about sustainable urban landscapes, we first have to recognize the challenges of the urban environment of what we're trying to place in a very challenging environment, which was not built for trees, trees are, or any kind of plants were an afterthought to the buildings, the roads, the sidewalks. And uh, to actually get plants into this landscape has been quite challenging. Um, also, the urban soils are a critical aspect and here you see a kind of picture that tells it all. Uh, here's this big ball of a tree going to go into that little uh, tree pit and uh, we're gonna hope for the best. And unfortunately that doesn't actually work very well in these very urbanized areas. So um, how do we define in fact sustainable? A lot of people have different ideas about this, but um, from my point of view, I think uh, it's basically when you have a sustainable landscape, you have ecosystem services uh, that are being uh, preserved and enhanced. Ecosystem services that are provided by the urban landscape, and that's plants and soil that can create sustainable cities. So, uh, and we talk about ecosystem services as uh, services that the plants and the soil provide for the environment for people, which is stormwater reduction, air and a water quality improvement, energy conservation as buildings are shaded by trees and so on, carbon sequestration, all this green material taking up carbon, reducing CO2, uh, urban heat island mitigation is the big one for uh, cities where we have quite a big increase in temperature in our urban areas, habitat for pollinators, animals, and there are many more ecosystem services I just listed a few that we can quantify and more and more we are quantifying these and providing a dollar value for these ecosystem services provided by the urban landscape. Um, so how do we get these? I mean, it's great to say we want these, but from my point of view and what we've been working on for many, many decades is how do you get the plants to live and thrive and provide these ecosystem services? So there's a process that sort of uh, helped me think about this very complicated environment. And it's what I feel is the important part of uh, creating an er a sustainable landscape is the establishing process. In other words, getting the plants and soils uh, in a situation where the plants are going to thrive. So it starts with site assessment. What are you dealing with? What kinds of conditions are you uh, having to face? Uh, urban environments are very heterogeneous. They don't all look the same. They have very different kinds of conditions. So we need to understand the environment that we're going to be planting. And then there's a kind of dual step of once you understand your site, you want to choose the plants that are adapted to those site conditions. And in many instances, our sites are so limited, we have to modify the sites. And that's what we're really talking about soils so that we can actually get plants to, to thrive. And then finally, in this landscape establishment process, there's transplanting uh, techniques and getting the plants uh, off to a good start in the first you know, one to three years. That's the process. And now the plants are going to, if you've done it right, they're gonna do well, they're going to provide the ecosystem services and um, that's what we can do. We can have the most influence when we do this landscape establishment process well. So let's just talk about some of those things. So by the way, when we say urban, we're not necessarily downtown anywhere. This is actually a well-known campus in upstate New York, otherwise known as Cornell. And this was the uh, renovation of a library and you can see the quad 
where there's all this, you know, machinery and uh, uh, places to work in and all this destruction in the, in the quad in the aid of uh, redoing this library there. So for three years, this building site was there on the Cornell campus. That's what I consider urban as much as a downtown area would be. It's where there's been a huge human impact on the landscape, mostly due to construction uh, or building of new uh, roads and buildings. So when you have this condition, it's as much urban as it would be downtown New York City. And even small cities where there's, there's going to be uh, utility work or some kind of uh, small process, the, the destruction to the soil and perhaps damage to the plants can be uh, significant. I want to point out here, you can see this little orange snow fence around the tree. That's supposed to be tree protection. Well, that's not tree protection. Of course, it's just somehow trying to keep maybe trucks away from the trunk of the tree, but we know what's happening in the foreground where the soil has been uh, dug out and compacted and all kinds of uh, damage and uh, materials put into the soil. That's where the real damage is occurring. So all this kind of construction activity, even though it's maybe brief or could be long, uh, has a tremendous impact on the plants and the soil. So the site assessment issue is understanding site opportunities and limitations. I mean, what, is, what are we gonna deal with? In fact, what you see in the background here is a building site where there was a new housing development put in. And this was the staging area, what we're seeing. And after the machinery and the um, materials were taken away, this is what was left. And uh, the building developer said to the city of Ithaca, I said, well, here, you can make this into a park. We're gonna give you this area. <laughs> and uh, it was quite challenging to understand what has happened here. How can we plant plants? How can we renovate, remediate the soil so that it will be supporting plants? So another thing we do in terms of site assessment, we under need to understand where the trees that exist are and where are the roots. I think we've all seen some of these, uh, you know, green strips or tree lawns or health strips or whatever you call them with some big trees in them. And you think, well, how is that possible that those trees are surviving uh, in such a small soil volume? And soil volume is gonna come up a lot, a, lot, a lot more in terms of what we need to do. But we did some work with uh, using a, a ex air excavation tool uh, to see where the roots were and what's going on. They can't all be just in those green strips that are gonna allow them to get to that size. You can see some pretty big trees there. So after we uncovered the roots, we painted them white so you could see just where the roots were. And of course, uh, the roots weren't in those green strips or they might be somewhat, but they're actually under the sidewalk and they went into somebody's front yard or backyard or churchyard or green and leftover area. And that's where the roots are getting what they need in terms of water and nutrients, oxygen, uh, appropriate temperatures, and so on, the basics that plants need. And you can also see by this picture that the roots are, they're just under that four inches of concrete that we took off. I mean, they're not down deep. Uh, roots typically don't go more than maybe 18 inches or three feet max in the best of soils. But in urban soils where it's coming compacted to before we lay our pavement, you can see some of the gravel there been compacted. The roots cannot actually access that soil. So they find an area of weakness between the uh, concrete and the base course and they can make their way through there and into somebody's front yard. They can get a lot more water uh, and nutrients and so on that they need. So the roots are really at the surface in most of the urban conditions we see. And of course that causes problems too because we end up having roots uh, heaving sidewalks and causing unstable work, walking conditions. And then uh, the outcome of that is often the demise of the tree as the roots are cut. So uh, roots, where the roots are and what's going on is an important part of site assessment. That might be underground conditions, but above ground, we've got um, the old urban heat island. And this is can be quite uh, substantial, uh, even more so in a hotter, drier summer as we're having now that the 
maybe surrounding temperatures might be uh, a reasonable temperature, but we might get 10 or 15 degrees hotter in the commercial residential area. Now I'll show you something that's, I always like to look at this picture. Uh, this is a picture taken with an infrared camera. It's a camera that measures the surface heat. Uh, and so what we're looking at uh, is uh, that dark, well, you, first on the right-hand side, you'll see a scale of temperature in Fahrenheit from 67, cool blue, to 105 is the kind of hot orange. And what we're looking at is a park, and you can see some uh, tree trunks there. And under the shade of those trees, you have grass that's pretty cool, about 67 degrees. When you come out from the shade into the grass surrounding that, you're getting into about 82 degrees into that green and blue grass. And so, you know, quite a bit warmer. And if you come right to the foreground where you see the orange, of course, if you were all in the audience, I would say, what is that? And you would tell me, oh, it's sidewalk. And you'd be right. Uh, so the sidewalk, whether it's asphalt or concrete, uh, really can increase the temperature or park cars. All these built materials can increase the temperature of that. That what in aggregate causes the urban heat island. So, okay, that was a really brief uh, view of site assessment, both underground and above ground issues. But um, when we want to deal with uh, doing our best for creating a sustainable landscape, we have to think of two things really from a point of view of plants. So we're going to talk about plants for a bit first. The first is you know, trying to find a plant that it's going to adapt to your site conditions or change the site uh, to make it better for the plants. So when you think about plant selection, we're thinking about the genetic potential of a tree. And on the uh, upper left hand of this slide, you'll see a very large tree. It's a London plane tree. And there's that little uh, sort of thing at the bottom is, it's actually me uh, with a stroller, my daughter. And uh, that tree, you know, you could, maybe six of us could put our arms around it to circumference. It was so large, it was showing its true genetic potential in an environment where it could grow to that. And genetic potential is all organisms have genetic potential. Um, we only grow to a certain height. We uh, have certain color hair and so on. But the genetic potential of the tree is, is such that given the best of all resources, it will grow to a certain size. But uh, where we're, what this tree is up against is the environment. So just as uh, if we were, as people, we were malnourished, we wouldn't grow as tall, we wouldn't look as good. Uh, and in terms of the tree, you can see on the bottom right, that tree is the same genetic material as the tree on the left, but it's in a different environment. So that environment is much more limiting in terms of allowing that tree to grow. So we can think of the genetic potential as the nature, the genetic material of the plant and what it could grow to. And the environmental reality is the nurture. How much is that environment allowing the tree to get to its true genetic potential? And sort of matching those things up is an important uh, process and the plant selection part of this. So I'm going to go through this slightly complicated uh, slide to show you some things that we look at in terms of choosing plants for uh, difficult conditions. So a lot of what we're dealing with in urban environments is a limited water availability. Not so much that it, it might be, for instance, there might be plenty of water uh, in the growing season in your area, but the way that trees are planted uh, in urban environments, their water often doesn't get to the root system. So you have a limited water availability. And there are adaptations that plants use to uh, deal with this. One is an avoidance. So we avoid water deficits by, let's say, maximizing water acquisition by having a really large root system, deep rooting, uh, increased water uptake, uh, or we could avoid water deficits by closing the stomates, the pores in the leaf, which uh, bring in uh, carbon dioxide and take, release oxygen and also release water. If, 
if the water uh, is not getting out of the leaf, it's kind of being uh, constricted, but also puts the model closure, which is a mechanism to reduce water loss, you're also reducing the ability for plants to grow because no carbon dioxide, no um, carbon dioxide is getting into uh, the leaf. And so um, you can also reduce, have a smaller tree. That's also another basically an idea of avoidance. But in the urban environment, we really want those plants that can tolerate. So don't have to go through avoidance mechanisms, but we want tolerators, those that can take it, basically take a droughty, hot season and still basically photosynthesize and are, are, are taking it uh, to be able to be functional. So this is uh, something we're working on is to find out those trees that have a tolerance of water deficit by adjusting what's in their cells so that they don't actually lose uh, turgor or, or they don't wilt. And so this is a much more difficult thing and for trees to do, but we've actually been testing this and I'll just show you a little bit about um, some of the work we've been doing on this. So, uh, so this is, a, I just want to say about uh, avoidance, like having a big root system. Well, that, that's, the urban environment often precludes the ability for roots to actually extend a long area and go deep because of, you can see here, this parking lot where this tree just went over because it only had about uh, four to six inches of usable soil. So the roots just stayed where they were and they had very little space to actually explore a larger volume of soil. So that idea of these trees avoiding it, it's just not gonna work where you have restricted soil. Uh, and this is another avoidance mechanism. Here's a solar linden, the Tilia tomentosa, a uh, beautiful tree. And if you look really carefully on the undersides of this leaf, which is fairly white, hence the name solar linden, you'll see these kind of trichomes or hair-like or amoeba-like structures on back side of the leaf. You can also see the, the pores there, which are the stomates, which where water is lost and carbon dioxide come in. And those trichomes or amoeba-like structures are actually shading and covering some of the stomates so water loss is reduced. So that's an avoidance mechanism. It's kind of neat. I love this picture. Um, but it's telling you why you have white on the undersides of uh, silver linden. But um, a tolerator is a tree that can manage turgor loss without, uh, we, we actually can manage drought without losing turgor. And it can be a universal measure of physiological drought and it's quantifiable and measurable. And we can rank species in terms of their physiological drought tolerance. In other words, they're not trying to close their stomachs, they're just sitting there with their stomachs open but really tolerating that drought. So we, uh, about 20 years ago, we started looking at uh, oaks in terms of their, they're naturally fairly drought tolerant and they have some issues that we wanted to deal with. And we had, had some breeding in 2004 to 2006. In the white oak group, uh, we had seven maternal parents, white oaks on the Cornell campus and we've got 36 pollen parents, um, with, uh, paternal parents from all over the country and somewhere all over the world. And we ended up with 350 unique genotypes, unique types of hybrid oaks, which we started growing. And uh, the first thing we had to know, these, all of these trees were unique genotypes because they had, even if they had same parents and uh, mother and father, each kid, each acorn was different. So just like parents give rise to ch different children, you could have the same cross, but different um, children or acorns in this case. So we, uh, uh, we grew these for a long time and then we actually started to, we needed to be able to, to propagate them if we were could, to capture the clonal nature of these unique hybrids. But one of the things we did before we uh, did that was to test some of these oaks for their ability to tolerate uh, water or drought. And on the left, you see two um, uh, oaks in the white oak family. 
And the one on the far left is well watered in the container, just well watered all season. And the one on the just right to that uh, oak has been sequentially uh, experiencing drought. So it would, we'd water it and then we'd let it dry down for a week or more and we water it again and then let it dry down for another two weeks and water again. So we had sequential drought. And they still look pretty good. I mean, they are, uh, in terms of what the one on the just right of that far left oak looks like. On the other hand, look at the, the right hand panel and you see this is not oaks, these are birch. The birch are not particularly known to be drought um, resistant. The one on the far right is well watered and you can see it's growing fine. The one on just uh, to the left of that had, had that sequential drought uh, cycles and it and its uh, its mechanism to deal with that it just drops its leaves it just says I'm, I'm i'm bored you know i'm getting rid of all these leaves which are losing water and i'll hopefully wait for a better time or if all the leaves drop the tree might die you can see the difference between the avoider on the right which is dropping its leaves to reduce water loss and the tolerator on the left the oak which is able to continue to grow, to keep its stomates open, to photosynthesize, even in the face of sequential drought. So this is what we're looking for, those tolerator type plants. And just to show you one graph, uh, uh, here we can see uh, on the top, this, the, these bars are showing the amount of turbid loss. So, the lower, let's say we see minus 2.5, minus 3, minus 3.5 on the x-axis, the more negative the uh, turbid loss point is, means the more that tree is able to tolerate a really droughty condition. So on the bottom three bars, you'll see those which were well watered, and they didn't really change much from spring to late summer. They were all well watered, but the ones on the top three bars were those in that sequential drought. So in the spring, it wasn't really drought stressed at all. In midsummer, uh, just started to get, you know, still a bit of a drought stress, but in late summer where it had experienced a lot of drought stress, it was able to step it up, if you like, and reduce its turbid loss point to beyond what would be normal for that well-watered tree. So it's able to actually respond to a dry environment and create a more uh, a tolerated type of mechanism. So we then had to actually propagate these plants so we can capture the clonal nature of some of these really excellent hybrids that we created. And of course, they were not, all of them were not great, but some of them were really good. Maybe out of 350, maybe I'd say 15 to 20 were really worth um, working with. And so to propagate oaks, Typically, it's, their oaks are propagated by acorns, which then lose the, the clonal nature of those hybrids. So we, we did this uh, mechanism where we actually cut back the trees. And uh, as the buds were breaking on the stem, we edulate them, cover them with a uh, pot and a brick so it wouldn't fall off. And then those edulated or shoots that grow in the dark would form and we paint and those etiolated shoots, which had not seen the light, are very much more sensitive to high, uh, auxins and rooting hormones and they actually do, uh, are able to root as uh, cuttings. We then paint the bases of those shoots with a rooting hormone and then cover it with a little shade so that they can acclimate to full light. And then we take off the shade and you can see those shoots coming up through uh, a growing meeting, which we put in those uh, cans, if you like. And then by the end of the season, we have shoots that have plenty of roots on them uh, from that original one plant. And these are clones. So you can see on the far right bottom, these are shoots that we took off of that one uh, tree. And these are clones of that plant. And of course, this is a, quite a painstaking thing, but we've been able to get clonal material and we're working on other methods now of actually increasing that propagation. Which is what you see here on the far right is we're going to tissue culture where we're actually clonally propagating these oaks and we're actually able to 
you can multiply them much faster than the method I just showed you. And that's one of our hybrids. It's a, uh, it's a quite a complex hybrid of uh, uh, bur oak and gamble oak with um, overcup oak. And it's here in Ithaca and it's growing in uh, just a lawn area. And it's one of the things we're, one of the plants we're first going to be introducing to the nursery trade uh, once we get enough of them. And this one is particularly drought tolerant. It can have a very low turgor loss point, so it's able to tolerate drought and not uh, lose turgor or lose leaves. Oh, and here, and then we gave all of these, we had a whole bunch of these oaks that we were, um, had propagated to a pretty large size, and we gave them away to communities in New York State, and uh, they were, they're in a long-term evaluation process now, and you can see the happy people with their hybrid oak uh, in the first year of planting. So just in terms of plant selection, um, I've thought a lot about this and there are basic tenets to what we should be selecting for plants that uh, will deal well with urban environments. First, we need pest resistant plants adapted to site conditions. And we know there are some trees, let's say, who are more or less pest um, tolerant and we can be choosing those. You don't wanna have to deal with uh, pests, uh, insects, or diseases that uh, can decimate the plants. So we can look for plants that are adapted to site conditions, both uh, in, in terms of the environmental conditions. We want non-invasive but highly diverse plantings. So the idea of having monocultures or uh, too many of one plant can, give, uh, can provide food for any particular insect or disease that comes down the street. And they always do come down the street. And in New England, we've studied the diversity of urban tree populations, and we've studied uh, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, and we find that the propensity of street trees are, I would ask you this if we are looking at you, but you would tell me they're all maples. Most of the trees of in the Northeast United States, street trees are maples, you know, somewhere between uh, 30 and 50%. Not just one species of maple, but several species of maple. And that's, you know, has, they're great trees. I love maples, but we have to have a diversity if we're gonna have a hedge against any kind of insect or disease that might be uh, brought into this, uh, this part of the country. And this is, by the way, the whole issue of one or a few trees being the most numerous is something that happens all over the world in Europe and Asia, uh, Africa, South America. It's typically a very non-diverse street tree population and we need to uh, diversify. And there are resources to help you look for plants that you may not be familiar with that are, uh, will do very well in your sites. So non-invasive but very highly diverse. <clears throat> And it has to meet the design of functional objectives of the site. Do you want shade? Do you want a screen? Um, what is the objective of the site? <clears throat> and the fourth is managing management limitations. Do you have to prune it a lot? Do you have the, front, the manpower to do that? Um, so these are basic tenets of plant selection criteria. And I think it's something to think about uh, when you're going to plant trees is to think about diversity, adaptation, and design functional objectives. <clears throat> so, uh, if we can choose the right plants, and that's a really important part, I mean, to choose good plants that will tolerate site conditions. Well, well we often get into a situation where we've just done you know, construction and we're going to put back the landscape or then we can see what we what we have on this site. The soil has been regraded, it's been mounded up, we have compaction of the soil with machinery and then we're going to kind of heal it over with a few inches of topsoil maybe and put some grass on it and inevitably the trees start to decline because they have to accept all this kind of uh, devastation. And here's that place in Cornell campus again that I showed you before. I'd like to show you some of the processes we've used to remediate 
compacted and um, just dead or trashed soils. This is the same now. It's the construction has been finished on the library, and they're going to be pulling out the machines and trucks. And you can see, uh, just looking at the surface, what the soil was like right in the front of, of that that library. So this is the good stuff. This is what we recognize as horticulturists and as arborists and uh, that is the good stuff. It has, uh, in the technical term, it has clumps and spaces. That's not the technical term, but I'm gonna use it here. Clumps are soils that are clumped together to provide water holding and nutrient holding and spaces which allow water to drain through and oxygen to come in. But in urban environments, we often get this kind of soil, which has been compacted uh, in the course of construction to bear load and to not be uh, subsiding. And this kind of soil uh, has two major factors. One, water doesn't drain through it, so it may sit on top of that layer. And then the, the soil is so dense that roots cannot penetrate it. So it might, soil might as well not be there if roots can't get into it from the plant's point of view. <clears throat> and I would say here that soil is more important than trees when you're dealing with the urban landscape. You can see a parking island here and the perfectly good red oak uh, in the parking island is just seeming to die back and it's looking poorly. And I had the opportunity to to when they were doing some work in this parking lot to look at that island that you see and look what happened after rainfall. There was no drainage. It did not drain at all because the soil underneath that island was compacted when they built the parking lot. So you have a bathtub. And when you have a bathtub, there's two things you can do. You can choose plants that tolerate standing water, and there are some. And you don't want to choose a red oak, which cannot tolerate standing water and needs uh, a, a well-draining soil. So you can make uh, use plant selection to be uh, some part of the, the solution, but also you can change the soil and make it more amenable to a large number of plants. So one process we've been working on for um, many years is what's called the scoop and dump method. Now this is a way to remediate compacted soil uh, using uh, a lot of compost and, and the deep uh, com uh, incorporation into the compacted soil. So what we do basically is apply at least six inches of compost. So that's just sitting on top, not, not talking about mulching or anything like that. This is about six inches of good compost on top of a compacted soil. We use a backhoe bucket to dig down to about 18 inches, uh, combining the soil and compost through creating veins of compost through the compacted soil of clods. We then, after we do that, we then plant and mulch with two to three inches of shredded bark or other organic mulch material. And we remulch yearly to maintain two to three inches of surface layer mulch until we have canopy closure. So we do this and we've done this now for 15 years, and I let's see where we go. we're up. And so that is at the same front of the library after we remediated and planted it. Uh, and then this is a couple of years later. So uh, it's done very, very well. It was totally compacted. We did the scoop and dump method, and we were able to really achieve a really sustainable um, landscape. What I meant by the way was canopy closure, which is when we want to have the shrubs of the trees uh, touching each other so we don't have a lot of bare soil between that. And generally when we plant, it takes, oh, one to three years before we get canopy closure if we're planting in the right spacing. Uh, because when we have canopy closure, we have very low weed uh, issues to deal with. The plants actually shade the ground and retain some moisture and we get a much uh, better effect. So I'm going to hopefully uh, start a little video for you that describes this method. This is a production of Cornell University. Whoops, I'm gonna go back. Try again. 
Sorry. Okay. This is a production of Cornell University. So this is a scoop and dump method that we used with our, our students doing the work. No, nothing less, you know, better than having 40 students doing some work for you. Uh, here we are applying compost to a really compacted uh, soil area next to the parking lot. Oh yeah, things get wet. You can see it's pretty deep, and we're applying compost to the whole thing. And then we come in with a backhoe, and we're digging down about 18 inches, digging and dumping, right? Notice the yellow flash around the existing trees. You don't want to get too close so that we're going to damage the roots of those trees. This one's going to be in the compacted area. You can see what there's something that's there. Let's go. And we go through the whole thing. And then we plant. We don't grow it till or smooth it out. We're just basically planting plants that will tolerate this uh, this is a swale next to the parking lot, so water is going to come in from the parking lot to this bio swale. I'll show you this a little time lapse on what's going on here. This is when we did this in uh, April of 2014. Doing the planting, and then we mulch the entire thing. We had a, a injection of compost to the soil and we plant and then we mulch two to three inches of shredded bark. And this is, uh, you know, this is early May of 2014. This is what it looked like after we were three, uh, three bioswales that were connected next to this parking lot. So we're hopeful now, four months later, here we are in September, things are going really well. I mean, when you provide soil volume, usable soil for plants, they respond, okay? Not just a hole, but creating a site where plants can really utilize that soil volume. They really respond. This is four months later after we planted. They're doing okay. Here's the water coming into the soils and being distributed. Now, next summer, the summer this is 2015, we're getting quite a lot of growth. Things have really moved on from that initial year. We're not at quite a canopy closure, but we're close. Ken has to be has to understand how to space plants so that you are going to get canopy closure. You can't put them too far apart. We have a really diverse planting palette, those that can tolerate really wet soils and those that are on the sides. And just two years later. Uh, and now we're really at canopy closure. The bioswale is totally closed in. We have very little weed pressure except on the edges where we meet the asphalt where plants can grow. So that's the only the weed pressure we have. But here are, I'm standing next to these bioswales and they're really uh, filling in very, very well. So we have a tremendously diverse palette. Uh, and we also have snow dumping in the, in the winter and the water. This but has it's been a production of very, Cornell very well. University on the web at Cornell. It's showing you it's not an impossible process. So the scoop and dump method uh, shows that we, we gain the soil resistance decrease, but basically the compaction is decreased. We get more pore volume, which means drainage is increased. And we, we have a reduction in bulk density, which basically means that the density of the soil is decreased, so we have better root penetration. We increase in carbon and nitrogen, improve soil structure, uh, increase aggregate stability. That's that, those clumps, when I showed you the picture of the soil with clumps and spaces, the aggregates or the clumps are become stable and actually increase in porosity. We get improved plant growth and long-term improvement of soil conditions and plant growth. We've done this, this particular uh, bioswell is 13 years old and it's doing exceptionally well. And one of the things that people often ask is, well, what, if you put so much, you know, six inches of 
compost into 18 inches of soil, that's a lot of compost. And isn't it going to basically be eaten and go away? And it's true. So what we do is added this the mulch on top is critical because the mulch gets, well, what, how, well, let's step back a minute. With the increase of compost, we're actually increasing the microbiome, uh, the microorganisms in the soil. They do the heavy lifting, okay? So the microorganisms are going to be creating structure, also utilizing the mulch on top and increasing the organic matter in the soil. So we're not losing organic matter as long as we mulch and the microorganisms then bring that organic matter down into the root zone. So we do the mulching at least till we get canopy closure, uh, and sometimes even after. But canopy closure gives you leaves fall and create their own mulch, and we're not gonna be losing organic matter and have subsidence, which is something we don't wanna have. So we found that over time, we actually, um, over 13 years or so in this process, I thought, well, I thought, well, things that would actually get worse after time, but in fact, they get better. The bulk density or the density of the soil actually decreases over time because we're increasing the organic matter in the soil and the structure of the soil is being improved by the microorganisms. So that was a, that was a surprise to me when we did the data is that we're actually reducing the density over time. And we also get lots more benefits in terms of the, the different factors that happen to the soil. And all this improvement of soil health and soil structure provides a great medium to grow plants in. So one more thing I wanted to show you was uh, uh, when we have purposeful compaction. So what I showed you before is inadvertent compaction due to construction. We're not trying to compact the soil, but of course it was compacted due to construction. When we're laying pavement, we have to purposely compact the soil so that the pavement is not gonna subside or fail. And uh, that needs another uh, technique to deal with that. So here we have a sidewalk, we have a, right in the foreground, you can see that square of wood that's going to be uh, paved with concrete. And what's gonna go into that square? I would ask you if I saw you in person. Of course, the tree is gonna go into that square. And then, you know, you see reinforcement and the uh, concrete is going to be laid and the tree is going to go in that square. Now the soil in that uh, around the square has been compacted and uh, a base course put on it and so it's been treated no differently uh, in the square than it is in the surrounding um, reinforcement area. And that's a problem because tree roots just cannot get out of those restricted areas. Here you see I, I saw the tree ball being placed into the coffin uh, and roots really can't escape more uh, unless they heave the sidewalk and get out of the, that area. But they're often restricted in these small spaces. So we, uh, we decided to develop something called uh, CU structural soil, which was to use that area under the sidewalk as uh, still a load bearing surface, but still could allow tree roots to get through it. And this is the idea of it. Basically, we have crushed stone about one and a half inches, and that's the angular particles you see here. And because they're basically all one size, about one and a half inches, when they touch each other, they create big pore spaces in between, and that's where our soil and our oxygen and our water movement comes from. So we have a rigid gravel uh, lattice, if you want, or, um, and then soil in the pores where roots can just shoot through those pores because the soil between the gravel is not compacted. Here's what it looks like. Uh, you can use different types of stone depending on where you are. We happen to have our cheap stone here in Western New York is limestone and that has implications for plant selection. That's what it looks like when it's mixed with the soil. There's a little bit of hydrogel we add to so we don't get separation of soil and particle stone. And then um, it looks pretty, you know, pretty stony, pretty droughty, but when it gets compacted, it forms this lattice or rigid structure, which can be load bearing for pavement and still allow roots to go through it. We did some testing, we planted some, uh, <laughs> built some sidewalks to nowhere and uh, had some structural soil separations here. We have some old clonal uh, acetoplatinoides here growing after several years, and we decided to take it apart, 
and see what was going on. So we took up the concrete and um, we had controls where we compacted it as a normal sidewalk and then we had the structural soil in these trenches. And uh, when we got, this is our structural soil root zone, we uncovered the entire thing using an um, air excavation tool in these three foot deep trenches, which were uh, restricted on the sides. You can see that very fibrous root zone. It's almost a kinked nature as the roots go through the stone lattice. And this is a control. You can see the compacted soil and then a little bit of base course and where we planted the tree there. And we also excavated that, which was much easier. And that was the uh, typical root zone of a tree in a compacted soil. The roots on the side sort of made it down the side of the trench, which we had compacted and they sort of didn't escape. But basically we did a pancake root system. And we, we wanted to actually look at the, if we can measure the roots uh, remotely without having to take it all apart, like we just did using a ground penetrating radar. And here you see the souped up uh, tricycle, which has the radar machine. It uh, we go over concrete or soil or whatever, and it will show us, we'll have a reflection back where the roots are in the soil. We tested it in this sidewalks of nowhere to make sure we were getting good um, agreement between what the radar was saying and what we actually saw when we took the trees apart. So uh, this was giving us confidence that we could use this to locate roots in other areas as well. So this is a kind of uh, detail or cross-section of what we would, how we would plant trees and structural soil in a sidewalk. Uh, we always, in the opening where the tree is, we always put good soil. We don't want to put structural soil in the tree ball, uh, tree opening itself. We only put it under the pavement. We want to maximize water and nutrients in the tree uh, ball planting area because, because structural soil is good. It does what it do, does what it's supposed to do. It is not particularly good in terms of water holding capacity. So we want to maximize that. We've done a lot of uh, planting. I have a lot of experience now with this. Here you see uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, we had uh, lace spark elms and calorie pears uh, after three years, well, and then after 12 years, and see how they're growing. The, on the top uh, left, you see tree pits with structural soil. In fact, that's not the tree, the structural soil goes through a trench from tree pit to tree pit, so it's not just in the opening you see there. And this is in uh, Homestead Elms uh, in Ithaca, New York, after eight years growth in structural soil. This was Sydney Olympic site using structural soil for these uh, oriental plains. Uh, it's Miami Beach, <laughs> palms in structural soil, uh, and doing very well, even uh, very high windy conditions. But one thing about the wind, because this, the roots get out so far, they have the trees are able to stand up as opposed to roots being in a restricted box where they would tend to go over in a windy situation. And we started looking at this from a point of view of ecosystem services and trying to reduce the problems of flooding. So traditional development, can you, you can have flooding events, which this is, a, this is actually a highway not too far from us, uh, where we had a big rain event and you just get a lot of flooding. So how can we use structural soil and uh, to actually increase this or deal with this situation. So structural soils allow uh, porous asphalt and structural soil was the, was the thing we wanted to try. We actually wanted to um, filter water through the pavement, slowly recharging the groundwater, reducing the need for retention, detention ponds and bioswales. It allows trees to grow in, in the paved sites. If we had structural soil and porous asphalt, wouldn't this be, you know, uh, covering two problems with one solution. So the reason why we could do this is that uh, look at soil alone. You'll see when you compact the soil uh, to proctor density, which is a standard compaction effort, we get about 34% just soil alone, 34% porosity, but on the lower part you see 2.2 and that's the macro pores. The macro pores only 2% which allow water and air to move through it. On the structural soil side, 
uh, you have 26% total porosity compacted to 100% crotter density. But we have 31% of that is the macropores, which allows water to move through it quickly. And the infiltration rate is greater than 24 inches an hour in structural soil, where it's less than a half an inch in typical compacted soil. So knowing this, we could actually put a system together. This was a little uh, parking area that near a trailhead in the city of Ithaca wanted to make this a better, uh, better construction. So we, we decided to use structural soil and porous asphalt to see if we can make this work. So here's the structural soil being put into the, uh, that whole parking area. It was like, it's like 24 to 30 inches deep, compacted. And then we put traditional asphalt on one side of it and the porous asphalt on the other side of it. And you can see in a rain what that looks like. The rain goes right through the porous and does not go through the traditional asphalt. We then saw cut, oh, there's, you can see, porous on the right-hand side and non-porous asphalt on the left side. Um, we saw cut into it and we planted uh, accolade elms into the structural soil. And then uh, I put big yellow barriers next to the trees so that no snowplow would take them out in the winter. Yes, a little bit over-designed from the point of view of those barriers, but those were little one and a half inch caliper trees and I was one of them to stay there for a long time. So that was the first year after planting. And this is about uh, four years later. And this was 2012 and this was 2019. So they've grown really, really well. And uh, we wanted to look at some what was happening with the porous asphalt group and the non-porous asphalt group. So the pores on the right, you can start to see that they're a little bit bigger than the non-porous asphalt group. Again, all in structural soil. But the non-porous asphalt group, they're starting to get, they're not growing quite as well as the ones in porous asphalt. So come back with our ground penetrating radar. The city wouldn't like us to take this all apart uh, after they built those whole parking lot. So we, uh, we actually scanned the root zones of the porous and non-porous asphalt and to see what we were actually seeing on the ground. So here you see this three, tree three and four were planted in non-porous asphalt, all in structural soil, and trees eight and nine were in porous asphalt with structural soil. That's the layout. And we had trees also seeing part portion, part uh, porous and non-porous, but I'll just talk about three, four, and eight and nine. So this is a slice, this is what kind of data you can get. Each pass with the ground penetrating radar gives you a slice and all those red dots are roots that they go, go uh, they pick up from the radar. And you can also see the depth. So from anywhere from you know, five inches down to about 25 inches down, we're getting some roots, we're seeing roots between, on the, both sides of those trees. And, uh, you know, this was good, we were getting roots down, but I like this, and this was in the non-porous lot, okay, non-porous asphalt. And we can say, what, what, what do we find in the porous asphalt? That's what we found in the porous asphalt, uh, ground penetrating, right? Each slice is a, a slice of radar, and the roots go way down up to 30, 32 inches deep, many more roots in the porous asphalt versus the non-porous asphalt. This is another way of looking at that data where we have a color coded. If we mash all the roots to the surface and look at density, root density, uh, the cooler blue or green colors means fewer roots and the hotter orange and brown colors means more roots. And that's what it looked like in the non-porous asphalt. And this is what it looked like in the porous asphalt. So many more roots, much deeper and just another way of visually looking at what the root growth was in those trees. And if we look at just all together, we're getting more roots in the surface first zero to eight inches, and about the same amount of roots, uh, porous and non-porous asphalt in the middle, but where we're really getting more roots is in the deeper, greater than 16 inch profile, many more roots in the 
a porous asphalt planting. So I just give live here some thought because this was a you were saying a couple of just uh, something to think about when you're planting, and this happens to be in porous and, and structural soil, but there's virtually only 18 by 18 inches and available to get water into the ground. So we need to think about water infiltration when we deal with soil uh, and paving. It has to have an infiltration, whether it's concrete block or porous asphalt or many different types of uh, porous materials. You have to get roots water down to the roots to make this work. So this is my last slide to so just, uh, I wanted to, I mentioned you need resources to be able to find and look for better trees and new soil techniques and a whole bunch of other things that are there, uh, trees, protecting trees during construction. So this is my website and I really wish that you go visit it and you can, there's a numerous things that you can see there. There's videos, there's uh, all kinds of free materials that you can download. And there's also something called the Woody Plant Database, which if you look at that, there are over 400 woody plants that are rated for different types of environmental conditions and lots of pictures. So it's a website full of information uh, and I really hope that you all use it. By the way, the picture you're seeing there is uh, Zuccotti Park in Manhattan, and all those honey locusts are planted in structural soil. So um, we like to see our work go out to where it's really gonna be useful. And by doing things at the beginning well, doing that plant establishment process well, we end up with much more sustainable urban forests and urban conditions. So I thank you for your attention. Wish we could have been there in person, but um, uh, we'll leave it at that. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.